Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Knowles. I am the Vice President of Grow Business and Corporate Advancement here at the Chamber of Commerce. And we are glad that you are all deciding to join us today on our webinar related to navigating the CARES Act for your business. With us today, we have um, Kenita Peterson and Andrea Medley from Thomas Howe Ferguson. Um, and they're gonna walk you through a couple of bullet points and slides. As a reminder, if you have a question, please put those in the question and answer portal. Um, please try not to put them in the chat. Uh, we will catalog the questions, and uh, I know that some of them will be answered with the material that our speakers have. If we don't get to the questions, we will make sure to copy and paste those, and our speakers will get those answers directly to you. As a note, we are also recording this session, and we'll have it available to you guys um, probably tomorrow. We'll have a link on our website as well as a link to the slides that are used here today, so you'll be able to access the recording again. And with that, um, Kanita and Andrea, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Dana. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad you were able to join us today. As you know, late March, the CARES Act was enacted into law. Um, it has over 800 pages. So our goal today is going to be to go over the areas that we believe are gonna be most relevant now for you as a business owner and answer many of the questions that we've been receiving as a firm and that you submitted prior to this webinar. So by far the hottest topic of the CARES Act right now is the Paycheck Protection Program, or you also hear it referenced as the PPP Loan Program. So the PPP loan program was basically designed to provide a direct incentive for businesses to keep their workers on the payroll. And if you did, and you met other criteria, then the loan would ultimately be forgiven. So let's start with who can apply. So most of your for-profit businesses are gonna be eligible for the PPP loan if you have 500 or fewer employees and you were in operation on February 15th, 2020 tax exempt not-for-profit organizations that are organized as 501c3s are going to be eligible tax exempt veteran organizations are eligible and you are also eligible if you're an individual who operates as a sole proprietorship or as an independent contractor now the instant entities that i mentioned before they could start submitting applications last friday sole proprietors and independent contractors can begin applying tomorrow, April 10th. So once you've determined if you're eligible, how do you determine how much you can borrow? So unless you're a business that started in 2020 or a seasonal employer, you're going to look at your average payroll cost during the calendar year 2019 then you're gonna take that number and you're gonna multiply it by 2.5. And that's gonna be your calculated loan amount. Easy, right? right? Um, so how do you go about determining what your average payroll cost is gonna be? So let's start by looking at what is going to be included in the calculation. You're gonna begin with the compensation that you pay your employees. You know, this is gonna include salary, hourly wages, commissions, bonuses, cash tips, or anything similar. It's gonna include your full-time employees and your part-time employees. You're gonna to add to this, which is basically cash compensation. You're gonna add payments made for vacation time, sick time, PTO, things that are of that nature. You're also going to add group healthcare coverage, and this includes your insurance premiums. Then you'll add retirement plan benefits that you paid. And then finally, state and local taxes that were assessed on the employee's compensation. So let's talk quickly, now that you know what's included in the formula, that's where you start. What do you have to take away? You cannot include any employee whose principal place of residence is outside the United States, so they will not be included. Also, the compensation of an individual employee in excess of an annual salary of $100,000. So it's important to note that the $100,000 cap is only on the cash compensation component. So the non-cash benefits, such as the health insurance, 
and the retirement benefits that we talked about, they are not gonna be included in that cap. You're gonna to get to take, uh, go over 100,000 for those items. All right, so we had a lot of questions around payroll costs. So let's stop and let's answer a couple of those questions. So if you are the owner of an S corporation, are your wages included in the calculation? Yes. If you receive traditional wages, you're receiving a W-2, you're including everything on your 941, then that will be part of your payroll costs that are included. Make sure you take into consideration the $100,000 cap that we talked about earlier. So do you include the employer's portion of payroll taxes in the calculation? No, it's just gonna be the, the categories that we talked about earlier. Our shareholder, member, partner, distributions, or sometimes you call them draws, are they going to be included in the payroll cost? No, they are not. You are just looking at employee salary and wages. So do you get to include any payments made to independent contractors or the form 1099 employee or 1099 costs that you incur? Do you get to include those costs? No, you don't. And I know there was a little confusion because earlier last week, they were included in the calculation, but as of Friday, these items were specifically excluded out of the guidance. Um, basically, that's gonna be because these independent contractors are gonna be eligible to file for their own PPP loan and allowing them as part of your business calculation would basically be double dipping. So what if I contract with a third party payer, such as a PEO to process our payroll? That's gonna be okay. They're still gonna be considered your employee for the calculation. You're probably gonna to have to gather some additional information from them to provide to your lender, but you do get to claim them as part of your payroll calculation. All right, so you figured out if you're eligible and you've determined your loan amount. So what exactly do you do next? Well, first you're gonna work with an SBA 7A approved lender. Now this is gonna be your traditional local financial institutions like banks and credit unions, but you're also gonna find that there's gonna be other approved lenders out there. Um, the SBA had indicated that when they rolled out the program, they had about 1,700 approved lenders and that they were adding hundreds every day to participate in the program. So there's a lot out there. Um, we've gotten a lot of feedback and I'm sure you've seen some press indicating that some financial institutions aren't accepting applications anymore. The portals aren't working. So we know that's been of a concern. But if you can work with the financial institution that you currently have a relationship with, you're going to find the process easier because they know you. Uh, they have to do less due diligence to go through this process. But I know that some of you, that's just not possible. So the SBA actually has a website that you can go to. You can type in your zip code and you can find the approved lenders within a certain mile of wherever your zip code is. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what that website is real quick. You want to jot it down. It is sba.gov slash paycheck protection slash find. So if you're finding difficulties, finding a lender, Go there and they will have some selections for you. All right, the loans are gonna be given out on a first come, first serve basis. So you want to go ahead and do this as, as soon as you can. And that actually the first come, first serve basis is when the financial institution submits your application to the SBA, not when you submit your application to the financial institution. Um, I do wanna take just a moment to have a huge shout out to our local financial institutions. They are really working tirelessly to service this community. Um, the volume here has just been overwhelming. And basically they had to create an entire infrastructure overnight to work with this program. Um, so they are working very hard um, to get you these loans. Um, it looks like the Senate took up the bill to expand the PPP funding, but it was blocked. So it looks like they're in recess until April 13th. So um, we won't know anything more about additional funds that may come to the table until at least that date. Um, and then also you might've seen that the Federal Reserve unveiled today some of the details related to another pro their program for infusing, infusing uh, money into the community and into the economy. 
All right, so what do you need to begin to gather for the lender? Well, first, check with your lender. If you're in a conversation with your lender already, they're gonna have a list, a punch list that you need to provide for them. Um, there are, they're gonna look a little different, but most of them are gonna have a similar quality, uh, similar items. So uh, you can start with the PPP borrow application. Um, as of Friday, I, I think on Friday, I'd received three different versions of it. So your best bet for the PPP borrow application is to go to the SBA's website and download the latest one. You wanna gather your entity organizational documents. This might be articles of incorporation, membership documents, things like that. Um, go to the Secretary of State's website and ensure you're still listed as an active business. You don't want any surprises there. Begin gathering your payroll reports. You're gonna need proof of employees on or around February 15th for 2020. Then you're also gonna need your 941s for all four quarters, 940 and W2s for 2019. And then if you are paying benefits such as health insurance or retirement benefits, then you're also going to want to gather the documentation for those items as well. You're gonna need your NAIC, NAICS code from your tax return. And then if you're part of an affiliated group, a control group, if you have related entities, you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna go ahead and map those out. That's a disclosure that is required with the application. So you wanna be able to be prepared to explain that and show that to your lending institution. For sole proprietors and independent contractors, um, they're gonna also submit things such as the payroll processing records and payroll tax filings. A lot of them might not have those as well. So you're gonna look for other proof of your income and expenses. And if you don't have documentation, then you're gonna to need to think through how you can provide that support, such as bank records, sufficient to demonstrate how much you make each year. Um, we also expect more guidance in this area, um, maybe even today. So there's probably gonna be some additional information coming on how independent contractors will go about approving their income to calculate their loan amount. So what exactly does the PPP loan look like? Well, first it's important to know that they all look the same. So you're not gonna go to one lender versus another lender and have different terms and conditions. Um, also, one of the reasons that this is such a hot topic is because some or all of it can be forgiven. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The maximum amount of the loan is $10 million. It's gonna have a fixed interest rate at 1%. And any unforgiven portion has a term of two years. So you can defer payment on the loan for six months from the date of disbursement. And there's no origination fees, no prepayment penalties, no collateral or guarantees are required. You can only apply for one PP, PPP loan. All right, so what can you use these funds for? So generally they're gonna be payroll costs like we discussed earlier. And it also is gonna include the group term help we talked about in retirement benefits, but it also includes mortgage interest, rent and utilities. And that kind of leads us into the discussion of the forgivable feature of this loan. So the amount of loan for forgivable can be up to the full principal amount of the loan and any accrued interest. So basically, you would not be responsible for any loan payments if certain conditions are met. So the loan must be used for the items we mentioned before, the payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent and utilities. Also, your employee and compensation levels must, meet, must be maintained. Your loan forgiveness will be reduced if you decrease your full-time equivalent employee headcount, or if you decrease salaries and wages by more than 25% for any employee that has made less than $100,000. And you'll have until June 30th to restore your employment and salary levels for any changes that were made between February 15th and April 26th. So non-payroll costs, such as the mortgage interest, the rent and utilities, um, they cannot be any more than 25% of the loan forgiveness amount. So to request forgiveness, you're going to submit 
a request to the lender that's servicing the loan, and it will need to include documents that verify the number of full-time equivalent, employee's pay rate, as well as payment on eligible mortgage interest, leases, rent, utilities, et cetera. Um, it's really important right now that you develop a good way of tracking these costs. Um, keep meticulous records on how the funds were spent. Gather the information quickly so that you can get your loan forgiven quickly. We're also expecting additional guidance on the loan forgiveness aspect of this. So we anticipate there'll be more clarity. We know there's a lot of questions related to that. Um, so we hope to have more information soon on that. So what other items do you need to know? All right, the, the amount forgiven under this program is not going to be subject to income tax. You cannot take out the PPP loan and take advantage of the employee retention credits that Andrea is going to discuss with us in a few minutes. Also, Governor DeSantis came out last week and said that the state of Florida is not going to collect any documentary stamps on these loans, so that's great. All these funds will be able to be used for necessary business costs. Um, we'd also received some, some questions related to um, boxes on the application if you, and how you complete those. Um, I think that you'll find if you download the latest copy of the application that's been resolved. Um, I, I think that was one of the primary changes on Friday. Um, we, we get a lot of questions about, you know, is this money going to run out? Um, as of Tuesday, the SBA said that they had about 70 million in funds and, you know, that doesn't even, uh, they had already provided in funds and that does not include those businesses that have filed an application with financial institutions, but the applications had not been filed with the SBA. So, um, I think the, the, we believe the funds will go quickly. Um, and we're hoping that Congress will move to allow more funds for this program. So what if you need additional funds or you need funds for something other than the items that the PPP loan provides? So there are a couple of federal and state bridge loans available. It's a little bit outside the scope of this presentation, but um, the information is definitely there if you need something more short term. However, the SBA has another loan, the Emergency Injury Disaster Loan Program, or the EIDL, that you may want to consider. Um, you actually apply directly with the SBA for this loan. It's not through a financial institution. Um, the EIDL loan will provide up to $100,000 of immediate economic relief to a business that's currently experiencing te temporary difficulties, and that $10,000 does not have to be paid back. You can have an EIDL loan and a PPP loan at the same time, but the $10,000 grant will be deducted from any forgivable portion of the PPP loan as that's um, finalized. So the interest rate for this loan is 3.75% for for-profit entities and for not-for-profits it's going to be at 2.75 percent. You can receive up to two million dollars and you don't have to have collateral or guarantees if you only need up to 25,000. There are also no prepayment penalties or origination fees. The term can be up to 30 years so it's really a longer term solution if you need it and you can also defer a payment up to one year. So right now we're gonna shift gears a little bit um, from the loan programs available in the CARES Act to various tax changes and benefits. So Andrea is gonna start and walk us through some of these changes. Thank you, Kaneda. So the CARES Act provides several tax incentives for individuals and businesses. So what does this mean? These incentives provide certain tax benefits and tax law changes. We'll walk through a few of those. Um, so let's start with individuals. Maybe the most notable individual benefit that we've seen in the news is the recovery rebate. If you are a U.S. individual with adjusted gross income of up to $75,000 a year, you're eligible for a $1,200 rebate. Now, if you file married filing jointly and you have an adjusted gross income of up to $150,000, you're eligible for a 
$2,400 rebate. There is also an additional $500 rebate per qualifying child. So families could expect to receive a pretty nice size rebate. It is noted, you know, if you, you earn over those threshold amounts that I mentioned, that the rebate will be reduced until it gets to zero. Um, so it just, you'd have to, there's calculators out there um, for what that rebate is. Um, one other incentive for individuals to be aware of is related to charitable donations for 2020. If you are a standard deduction filer, meaning that you take the standard deduction on your tax return, you will be allowed a $300 additional deduction for any cash contributions made. Now remember, that is for cash only. Any non-cash contributions do not count. So some people may itemize um, their deductions on the return. If you do, you won't get that additional $300 deduction. But the limit of charitable deduction on your itemized deductions is increased to 100%. And that normal limit is 50 to 60%. So now let's turn to some changes for businesses. We'll start with the employer-related benefits, um, going through some of, some of the payroll things. So let, let's dive into that. First, um, employers will be allowed to defer paying the employer portion of certain payroll taxes through the end of 2020. The deferral is for the employer portion of the Social Security payroll tax. So if you defer this, when do you have to pay it? That deferral will be due in two equal installments. The first installment of 50% of the balance will be due at the end of 2021, with the remaining 50% due at the end of 2022. What is very important to note here is that this defer deferral is not available if you take advantage of the debt forgiveness under the PPP loan, as Kanita discussed. So remember, you won't get a deferral of payroll taxes if you take advantage of that debt forgiveness under the PPP loan. Another related employer benefit that we'll turn to now, and Kanita mentioned while she was talking about the PPP loan, is the employer retention credit. This credit is available to certain employers carrying on business in 2020 who have had to close due to COVID-19. And they will continue to pay their employee wages during the period that they are closed. So if you fall under to this category, what credit do you get? The credit is going to be equal to 50% of qualified wages with a maximum amount of wages at $10,000 per employee. These wages will be paid anytime after March 12th through December 31st. And as Kanita mentioned when she was talking about the PPP loan, this credit is not available to employers receiving that loan. The last item to be aware of for if you're an employer with payroll, if you fell under the sick leave and family leave mandate by the Families First Act, there are some payroll tax credits related to this. Um, it is also the employer portion of your Social Security tax. This will track the same limits to the wages that the mandate includes. And these wages are paid from April 1st through December 31st. So if you have any employees that fall under the sick leave and family leave mandate between April 1st and December 31st, you may qualify for these tax credits. Now that we've went through some of the employer payroll related benefits that the CARES Act um, initiated, let's touch on some other business tax changes. The first one I'll touch on is the technical correction to the 2017 Tax Act. Um, many of you may have encountered this, but the 2017 Tax Act had a technical error that did not allow qualified improvement property to be eligible for accelerated depreciation. So the CARES Act went in and corrected this and now this improvement property 
is eligible for accelerated depreciation and it is retroactive. So since it's retroactive, if you had to capitalize some of these improvements because of this error, this year you'll be able to take a pretty nice tax deduction probably. There is also a change to the deductibility of interest expense. The 2017 tax law change or the tax act provided for a limitation on interest expense deductibility that was based on adjusted taxable income. The CARES Act is temporarily increasing this limit for 2019 and 2020 from 30% of adjusted taxable income to 50% of, of adjusted taxable income. So this change may allow, depending on your situation of your threshold, may allow a greater interest expense deduction for you in 2019 and 2020 on your tax returns. So let's wrap up the tax section with some business changes specific to corporations. Um, if you'll recall, again, the, the tax act that was in 2017 um, had some tax changes to the NOLs for corporations. Um, this limited NOLs to 80% of taxable income and it eliminated the ability to carry back NOLs for most corporations. The CARE Act basically reverses these elements temporarily and adds a five-year carryback. So what does that mean? So that means for 2018, 2019, and 2020, NOLs generated in those years are eligible for a five-year carryback and are not subject to the 80% limitation of taxable income for carrybacks or carry forwards of those NOLs. Now, one thing I will note, if you do have generated an 2018, 2019, or 2020 NOL, those for corporations are at a 21% tax rate. Those five-year carryback, if you do have income to carry back to, may be at a higher tax rate. And finally, for corporations, if you are subject to AMT, they created AMT credit your remaining credit will be fully refundable in 2019. Um, they originally was gonna go through 2021. So that's a lot of information on taxes from individuals to businesses to consider. Um, make sure you're talking with tax advisors on what these items mean for you, for your taxes, um, what the impact will be for, for you, your company, or you individually. So now I'll turn it back over to Kanita to discuss the retirement changes due to the CARES Act. Thanks, Andrea. The last topic we wanted to cover today are some of the changes that the CARES Act made for retirement plans. So first, there is a new distribution category that you can add to an existing plan. You can permit an in-service COVID-19 distribution for a participant's vested account balance without regard to any of the current restrictions that you may have on withdrawals. Um, this distribution can be made during the calendar year 2020. So it has to be before December 31st, and it has to be for an eligible participant. So who is gonna be considered an eligible participant? First, if someone is diagnosed with COVID-19, has a spouse or dependent that's diagnosed, or there's kind of a catch-all category, um, has experienced adverse financial consequences. So let's talk about this. So advanced financial, adverse financial consequences as a result of a quarantine, furlough, layoff, reduction in work hours, business closure, lack of childcare. So there's a lot of different factors that are going to allow someone to qualify. The participant will self-certify that they are eligible. So basically they need to be able to certify that they have adverse financial consequences due to one of those items. And you as a plan administrator, you can rely on the participant's certification of the above. So what are these distributions gonna look like? They're gonna be limited to $100,000. Um, they're not gonna be subject to the 20% mandatory tax withholding that you typically have. They will be subject to a 10% 
federal tax withholding unless the participant wants a different amount, a higher amount withheld. They will be exempt from the 10% early withdrawal penalty that you typically see for participants who are 59 and a half or younger. And the amount will be taxable over a three year time period. You can also repay these distributions any time over the three years. And if you repay distributions that you've already included in your taxable income, you can go back and amend your tax return to get that money back. They've also added a few new loan provisions. If a participant wants a loan, your current limits may be temporarily increased to the lesser of $100,000 or 100% 100 of the participant's VESTA balance. So this is only going to apply to loans made on or before September 23rd, 2020. And it's only gonna be for the same group of eligible participants that we talked about earlier. You can also modify your plan to allow participants who currently have loans to delay those payments for up to a year. So interest will continue to accrue during this time period, but you can also extend the term of that loan for another year. If your plan currently does not allow for loans, then you do need to add that provision to your plan document. There are also changes for required minimum distributions. So participants who turned 70 and a half prior to 2019 will not be required to receive an ongoing R&D for 2020. And participants who turned 70 and a half in 2019 and who did not receive their first R&D for 2019 on or before January 1st will not have to receive their RMDs for 2019 or 2020. And if a 2020 RMD has already been issued, you can roll it over into an IRA or another employer plan and not pay tax on those funds. And one of the really great parts of all these benefits is that these provisions can be adopted immediately and you can amend your plan later. So I know we went over a lot of information today. Um, I wanted to mention that we have set aside a section of our website to post information specifically related to the CARES Act and other COVID-19 relief that you can reference at any time. Um, if you have any questions that weren't covered here today, I, reading the screen, a lot of the ones that were here, we did cover. If we did not cover them, we will respond to you directly and answer those questions. Please also submit any additional questions to, there's an email address on the screen now. You can also submit them to Dana and we will make sure we get your question answered. Also, we thank you for your time today and from the entire Thomas Hall Ferguson family, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Kanita. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I just wanted to, I know you guys have been uh, monitoring some of the questions here um, and I, what's been covered. Um, are there any that you guys are, are currently looking at now that you think you can answer or um, just want to go ahead and, and uh, reach out to them directly following the, the webinar? There, there's a few, um, a couple of them we covered it, but it, it doesn't ma it doesn't hurt to go over them again. Um, are, are company owners eligible for PPP, whether they are on the payroll or not? It does matter. So we talked about earlier, only salaries, whether you're an owner or not, only the salaries are gonna be included in the payroll calculation. So if you're not receiving a salary, then any amount that you're being given, whether it's a distribution or a draw, money from a due to do from, none of those are going to be included in your payroll tax calculation. Um, that is similar for S corporations, um, especially one person entities that have distributions. Is that gonna be included? No, um, distributions will not. Um, is an S corporation, if we take advantage of the PPP, are we penalized in terms of forgiveness? If we make shareholder distributions using those funds, those funds you're going to certify when you fill out the application that you're only going to use the funds for the items that we covered, the payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, et cetera. So 
um, you are not allowed to use those funds for other um, items uh, such as in this example, shareholder distributions. Um, there's some questions about self-employment. There, Right now, what I had went over in the program, that's really all the guidance we have. We do anticipate there will be more clarity with regards to that calculation. But right now, you're, if you don't receive 1099s, you're gonna need to be able to show the lending institution basically how much money you made last year. So using the documents and the bank records, be able to kind of build that puzzle for them. Um, so our lender closed quickly for PPP loans before we made application, but hopes to reopen next week. Do you think it's so urgent to get the application submitted? Um, it's really hard to tell. I would hate to even try to guess on every lending institution has a different process that they're using now. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of things that our lending institutions don't even know. And so it's hard to know when exactly the money will run out. So I would stay close to them and definitely get an opinion from them on whether they think they're going to have additional funds or if you need to seek a loan somewhere else. Um, if you submitted a question via email and we have not answered it, yes, we will email you back. Um, and so 501c6s are not allowed for the PPP program. The, the two were the ones that uh, we had mentioned er earlier, the 501c3s and the veteran organizations. Um, if you're still working from home, that counts as working. So whether you're working in your original you know, bricks and mortar that you're used to, or you're working at home, um, taking care of your kids, is if you're working and you get paid to work, that's co still considered working. You're still considered being paid as an employee. Um, there, there are definitely some special rules for lobbying firms. Uh, we, we will reach out directly because those can get a little complicated. So we can, we'll reach out directly related to the lobbying questions. I think that covers a lot of them. Uh, anything that we didn't cover, Dana, we will make sure we go and answer specifically to them. And we can also, anything that we did not cover that we have provided an answer for, we'll update our website so that everybody can take advantage of any questions that aren't already covered on there. Okay, great, thank you, Kenita. Um, and everyone who's still on the call, you can see in this last slide um, that they have a specific uh, COVID-19 questions portal uh, at Thomas Hall Ferguson. So you can send questions right there as well when we are, are done with this, if you think of something. Um, but they will be able to see the other questions uh, that are outlined here that people submitted. And uh, again, thank you both for joining us. We will be um, getting this recording up as soon as we can and sending it out to everyone who joined us today. Um, so we just thank you for taking the time. Um, thank you for joining us and stay safe and stay healthy. And we hope to see you all in person soon.